horsing around. Oh, we're always horsing around. So. <laughs> um, I'm going to let Evelyn pronounce her last name. She told me how to pronounce it, but I'm still afraid I'm going to mess it up. So, Evelyn, oh, would you, you introduce yourself? Last name is Evelyn. 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 Evel
how does that interact? How does that interact with the free world? I guess is my question. How how are they a piece of that central source? Well, I think in some ways the the idea of the three realms really helps us with our ordinary reality perceptions. You know, our brains are organized based on the information we receive from our senses. And while we can perceive those things that fall outside of our ordinary senses, it's often helpful to have some kind of bridge for us to receive that information. You know, in, in uh, if you think about typical paranormal uh, investigations, there's usually somebody that functions like a medium, and they would be that bridge between that which is the visible world and the spirits that are no longer physically tangible. And in some ways, the three worlds operate in that same way as a bridge to help our ordinary reality mind receive information from, I can't even say spaces, but the other dimensions, uh, the spirit world, whatever words you want to use for it, that, are, that lie just beyond our ordinary senses. And so it gives us something that feels familiar, like you're traveling to a place. And right. in that place, then you can receive the guidance, the insight, the healing, whatever it might be, in a way that your mind can more easily uh, assimilate. You know, instead of being in this kind of place where there's nothing that is a touchstone for our senses, we'd be, you know, kind of lost and formatted for our screen so we can understand it. That makes sense. You know, you know, you got to have that kind of bridge because if you think about anything in the spirit world, and I'm, I'm going to talk more about the, the spirits of the dead that are trapped here, which is probably more of your purview that you work with. But the, the spirit world doesn't have uh, the same parameters that we understand. We, we are located as when we're in our bodies in a point in time space. And both of those don't operate in the spirit world, neither space nor time. You know, there's right. this, this, this encompass, encompassing something to which you go back into, that one, like you were talking about. And <clears throat> so to have some way to decode that so we can actually use the information in our ordinary life, we need that bridge. Absolutely. That makes sense. Mm-hmm. And, and you, you talked about time, and time, time is the interconnector. Is that how you believe also? Is that, is that how, I mean, the spirit world obviously doesn't work in time. Of course, that's what our group believes wholeheartedly. But is is time the connection between the two? You know, I th- I think of time the way my spirit teacher explained time to me was that that we could think about it like stations on the radio. That all the time periods are playing at the same time, but we are mm-hmm. only ever two. We're only ever tuned into one or another, or sometimes we get kind of tuned between stations, you know, and you get that bleed through. But I think it's difficult for us to even conceive the idea that all time is happening at once, because our experience of it is that it's linear. You know, the, the experience in the physical body makes it so different than what, you know, the physical... In time, we're in all of them. Yes. Yes. Yeah, I mean, and that, uh, that, that whole idea of, um, particularly I think of a stuck spirit, uh, spirit of the dead that's stuck here, they're still really in their own time band if they are not interacting with this realm. You know, you can, you can perceive them like somebody who was killed on their way to work continuing in this time loop to just keep going to work. Or they might uh, appear with other members of their uh, time period. Sometimes there there are those that are able, for one reason or another, to interact with the time stream in which we're living. But it, it it's so much more complex. I think that's why it's so so amazing to me is that it's so much more complex than we can imagine. And and yet in interacting with. Uh, other realms, whether, you, whether you're talking about other realms of existence in, in the way a shaman would refer to it or working with the spirits of the dead here, there's this, you know, it stretches us in a way. And to me, it makes the experience that I have in my life that much more precious 
you know, the fact that we experience time as linear makes our life seem that much more poignant and sweet because we see that it has a beginning, a middle, and an end, which our, our mortal experience is certainly linear like that. But when we tune into that other aspect, we also recognize that we're timeless. We have this eternal quality that is part of all that is, and it's this it's this interesting balancing act between the two. You know, we're, we live a paradox. We live the paradox of being uh, uh, limited, mortal, you know, you're, you're here for a particular time span with this per- particular personality, and, but you're also this being that transcends ordinary time. Right. And to me, trying to hold those two things is um, a challenge, but it's also... Again, it helps to make the the ordinary life that much sweeter. You know, you know that you only have this particular existence for a brief period of time. If you think about all time, you know, it's just this right. little sliver of under a century, and you know, you can pack a lot of living into that and a lot of experience into that. And I think we then can carry that experience into that larger self of who we are. It's like there's this marvelous feedback loop between what we experience in the, uh, the sensory world and what our spirit is experiencing in the, in the rest of our existence. And there's this kind of communication back and forth within, within ourselves, and we're also capable of communicating to other uh, spirits in the same way. So let's back up just a minute. You were talking about residual, well, what we call residual, like a time loop. You know, they, they repeat the same thing over and over and over. My sister actually came up with uh, an interesting uh, theory on that. And she was talking about soul retrieval. Mm-hmm. And we had talked about whether that residual spirit is actually a piece of the soul of the person it was. You, do you think that that's possible? Or is that something you've come across? Oh, yeah, I think that's possible. And I think the, the entirety of their their particular lifetime can be stuck here. But again, you know, when a, any one of our lifetimes is really just a fragment of who we are in that in that larger soul. Well, it's like, so it's like looking at us from the space sense. I mean, if you... If I, when I, when I was a kid, I used to land my dad's truck. We lived out in the country and I'd look up in space and think, and I still think about it. How far does space actually go? You know, we don't, we right. don't have any idea how big that, that expanse is at all. Right. And, and it's always been an interest of mine. And, and really, time is very similar and it really has no end in, in essence. Right. I mean, we live these small little movies, so to say. In, in our, you know, whether we're reincarnated, we believe reincarnation, we are reincarnated, or whatever. Um, we flip these little movies, learning things and moving on, but it really, the time, we don't, the soul itself never actually dies. Right. 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 I completely right. agree. I'm smart. God, I'm smart. It's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, buddy. <laughs> I didn't hear his comment. He said, he said, I was, he said, you're smart, Dad. <laughs> oh, nice. <laughs> see? <laughs> yeah, it was, it was oh. pretty smart. Oh, there, there, was a, there was an expression to go with that, I guess, huh? <laughs> right, right. The, the body language really made that happen. Ah, <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> oh, the limitations of radio. <laughs> right, right. Well, we used to have a video show, but that, that kind of went kind of a different direction, and, and uh, actually this has been really good for our, our team and, and good for the show, and, and uh, we're really enjoying it here with Denny. We love you, Denny. And uh, <laughs> I actually like the radiation more than you. Uh, can't, we can't see you? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can. <laughs> I love my son. He's, he's kind of his own little individual person, but... So let's get back on track here. I saw something the other, uh, I think it was yesterday, did I send you that or was it today? I can't remember now. About uh, the paranormal. You're, you're doing some uh, uh, a, 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 a conference? Was it a conference on paranormal? 
I can't find the flyer right now. That's why it's turned Are you talking? Are you talking to me, John? Yeah, I'm talking to you, Evelyn. Sorry. Okay. No, that's all right. Um, we're teaching a weekend workshop on how to help people to cross spirits over that are stuck here. Okay. So, how so can you go into detail on that? I mean, I don't want you to give away a free you know, your your workshop for free. But oh no, no, no. Can you go into detail? Yeah, sure. How well, the shaman actually go through that process of, of, of helping spirit move on? Yep. Well, first of all, there's a word for it, which I think is pretty cool. It's called psychopomp, which means guider of souls, and it can be guiding people, supporting them in their dying process, and also then making sure that they, as I like to say, make it all the way across the finish line and don't get stuck here. Right. And... Uh, you can do that through journeying. You can work with somebody who, for instance, is on their deathbed and they may be struggling with letting go. You can sit with them in the earth plane and talk to them. You can also journey to their spirit and actually assist them, take them part of the way. And if they're stuck here, you work with your teacher or power animal to um, first of all help them to know that they're deceased because sometimes the ones that are stuck here either died suddenly or they um, they have, based on whatever their particular upbringing was, they don't feel like they're um, good enough to go anywhere good, so they figure they might as well just stay here. <laughs> or, they're, or they're really attached to a place or an object or sometimes a person, you know, like a, a parent or a grandparent may hang around uh, a family home to look after children. And so they have to be um, supported to know that they need to cross all the way into the spirit world so that their their capacity to continue to grow is there and that then they are free to communicate with those that they love through their dreams where they can actually be more effective. And that um, that whole process is actually... I find one of the really rewarding kind of things you do in shamanic work. The, the clients don't pay very well as they're deceased, but the, uh, <laughs> uh, the the fact that you can actually clear a clear a space, allow somebody to make that crossing all the way through, <clears throat> gives it gives a twofold thing. It helps that spirit, you know, move on, but it also lightens up. The earth plane. You know, there's a lot of heavy leftover energy here from people who are stuck. And moving them on is, uh, it's helpful to the living and helpful to the spirit that is stuck here. And it, to me, we think of the ones that are stuck here, even if they're miserable buggers, you know, you kind of retain your personality if you're stuck here. So if you were a sweet little old lady, you're a sweet little old lady spirit. And if you're a mean bugger, you're going to be a mean bugger of a spirit. But we think of them all as suffering souls because they didn't get to make that final completion. They didn't make it all the way out of here. And so that supporting them is something that feels, um, well, to me at least, it feels like really powerful and poignant work. You, know, you think about people finally being able to be reunited with their loved ones in the light or um, just be set free. You know, they don't now, feel burdened. Now, now, do you feel that, okay, so, and I understand all that process. My, my question, I guess, now would be, do you feel that they can come back, not just in dreams, but to come back, you know, say, uh, and communicate through, like, some of our devices and try to communicate? Oh, oh, yes. Yeah. I think they can, absolutely. But it allows them to communicate in a way that's much more effective because oftentimes when they're stuck spirits, first of all, they um, there's a kind of dissonance when it's like being out of phase. You know, like the radio tune between the station. You're slightly out of phase. You're not physical. You're not completely out of here. You're in that in between space. So communication is not always easy. Once they move off into the light, it's it's much easier for people to have experiences of them that are that are helpful. They have a sense of 
piece of the loved one has finally crossed over. Of course, if somebody has had a journey, they can actually journey to the spirit wherever they are. And it it, it just makes it, um, I think, more compassionate for everyone. You know, when they're stuck here, they're really incomplete, you know, and they're and they're out of phase with with they're stuck between the two realities. You know, they haven't made it all the way across the finish line and they're not physical anymore. They're like kind of trapped between. I, I think I can see that. I mean, I can see that, uh, you know, and, and some of the evidence we get, maybe this would clear it up for people listening. Sometimes uh, it's maybe not so clear what they're talking about or what, or even what they're saying. Um, right. Maybe that, um, you know, some of the ones that we get that are, are extremely clear have gone on, or, you know, I think sometimes the residual ones are pretty clear, too, but I think that's a whole different stuck loop. Um, mm -hmm. Is that light just dim? <laughs> <laughs> well, somebody agrees with you, apparently. <laughs> Hello? Well, we are in one of our tour locations, so it's not uncommon for us to see things while we're doing the show. Um, but... Uh, <laughs> I don't know that I've ever seen the life system in this dining room. <laughs> anyway, Jim, did you have a question on here? Or no, okay. Well, I think I'm only in chapter three. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, how often do you get uh, called in to work with, uh, like, the psychopomp, doing the psychopomp work? Like, pretty often? Um. Probably, I would say a few times a year. You know, it, there are there. It, we live in a place where there's actually a pretty large uh, spiritualist church community, so they also do a lot of that work. So we we have lots, uh, all hands on deck here. I think helping to move spirits along, whether they be in the shamanic community or in the spiritualist church, they're uh, assisting souls to move forward. <clears throat> which is, I think, great. Is, is the, is the area you live in is, is very pretty. I mean, I haven't been there, but I, I've, I've seen pictures. The, is that is that pretty a common thing there? Is, the, is spirituality more important maybe than religion? Is that like the, the area you live in? No, you know, Maine is a funny place. It's It sticks out there all the way in the east, and in some ways it's off the radar. Right. It, 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 you know, and so there's there are a lot of people that moved up here in the, uh, it, of course, it's been inhabited for a long period of time by by not only Native Americans but also by uh, European Americans. There, <clears throat> there is um, a sense of it being a kind of healing place that people come here to either learn how to be a healer or be healed. And I think that kind of carries through with people's connection to their spirituality, whether they're part of a church or they're following uh, different spiritual traditions. You know, there's, right. there are, there's a lot of openness up here. Again, I think because we're just a little off the radar. So there's a, a remarkable openness that actually is surprising. I, I grew up in New York on Long Island, which is you know, a uh, suburb of Manhattan. And I think people in Maine, particularly on the coast, tend to be more open-minded than people from where I grew up, which I, I found to be uh, actually quite remarkable. And I think it's because people have so much of a uh, relationship with the natural world with the the power and wildness of nature, I think that um, gives you a really different perspective on everything. You know, no, you're, go ahead. No, I was just going to say that, you know, I, I guess I never thought about Maine as a, you have to be a pretty hardy person to live in Maine, I would think. I mean, that's right. yeah, a yeah. cold, pretty cold area. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, you, you folks in Missouri, you need to know we got 30 inches of snow the other day. We got an additional 8 inches of snow today. We're going to get more on Monday, and it's going to be 0 degrees tonight. <laughs> <laughs> so you guys just pretty much just hang out in the house this time of year, I mean, really. <laughs> yeah, well, there are hardy souls that actually do things like 
ice fishing, which is it's a really quite extraordinary thing. They build little houses that sit out on the lakes that are frozen. They drill a hole in the ice and they fish. I, think I, I know that, that sounds... <laughs> it's completely absurd, I'm sure, to somebody from Missouri, but they do that. It's what people do. I think it's pretty cold here, but, you know, I don't know that it's, it doesn't get that. I mean, it gets zero, yeah. and we just don't get that much snow. We mostly get ice. That's our big thing, and usually starting around February. And yeah. We're supposed to be filming a show in February, and I'm thinking, <laughs> how the hell is this going to work? I mean, really. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they didn't, they didn't quite inquire about the weather before they made that decision. But <laughs> we're <to> the ice thing. <laughs> I gotta say, ice is worse than snow. I'll take snow any time over ice. Oh hey, yeah, you can get around in some snow ice. You just you might as well just stay in the house. Yeah, it's like getting out. Yeah, tree. You know. Yeah, it's we went yep. seven days one year without any electricity or heat or anything. Yeah, yeah. So. Anyway, we want to talk about fairies and green men. I thought was, you, you sent me an email, kind of some ideas of, of things that uh, are part of the, the paranormal world. Mm-hmm. And, and for those of us that are not of the Christian faith, maybe I should say, or a, a huh? more orthodox, more orthodox, uh, that's not really paranormal, but I, I, it is considered to be paranormal among uh, a lot of, of, of the earth. <laughs> I'll say it nicely. So, do you deal uh, with a lot of fairies and things like with, with other elemental spirits uh, during your shamanic work? Oh, sure. I mean, everything in nature is alive, and all of our ancestors, no matter where they came from, honored some kind of nature spirits. My ancestors are from Scandinavia, and so even my grandparents who had moved here uh, in the early part of the 1900s, when I was a little girl, my grandmother still put out food for the Nyssa, which are like the fairies that used to help around the farm. Now, she lived in suburban New York, in a house my grandfather built, but she would put out food for those beings that, when she was a little girl, they would feed them to make sure that the cows would give good milk and that the farm would run well. And just like, you know, people in Ireland talk about the leprechauns or um, the the fairies in England or the green man, there, there are these, I think of them as spirits that sort of stand with one foot in the spirit world and one foot here, and they're they're like uh, the um, epitome of wild nature. And I and I've seen uh, we, like I said we, I grew up on a farm in, in Oklahoma, and, and I've told this story before, but I saw this approximately three foot tall furry man jump out of a I guess a man I don't know it was man shaped humanoid. <laughs> But not very tall, jump out of a bush one time. And, and it was, I've never seen anything like it since. And, and, and up until just really recently, I really had no idea what it was. I mean, I still, I think it's some sort of elemental, but I wouldn't know. I don't know what, what kind of elemental. Well, I mean, many Americans have stories of little people, when there's like Irish fairies, which are not helpful. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, so there, there's stories of different parts of the world of fairies or similar creatures being helpful in the Avon and, and then other places they are uh, tricksters and um, uh, kidnap people, um, things like that. And in Ireland and North America, maybe they're, they're, they're tricksters. And so, and you grew up around Indian land. Uh, yeah, absolutely. The, the land I lived on. Uh, we had a, a Lakota Sioux shaman come out and uh, do a couple of sweat lodges when I was a kid on our land, and she would tell me about the uh, uh, the spirits and such uh, that were on the land. There's there's still where where the camps were. Now we had a couple of natural uh, ponds that were excellent places for you know people that didn't even have fish in them and everything. So right, uh, it was that a place to have a camp. Yeah, and then. Um Go the trees. This location was actually up on a hill, so you could see, you know, like you know, you talk about your property out there, where you could see 
in 360 degrees, you know, mm -hmm. it wasn't a super tall hill, but it was enough to see out, you know. Mm -hmm. And there was a grove of trees nearby and so forth. And there's probably more back then, you know, because we didn't go through and, you know, beat up the land for hay. But, uh, so yeah, I mean, that was, that was pretty common. Uh, well, and, and the shamans in traditional cultures usually have ways of working with all those spirits. First of all, you, you have to be in, in right relations with all the beings that are around you. So it may be the spirits of the water, the spirits of the animals, the birds, the, those nature spirits that we're talking about. You have to be in relationship with all of them and helping to, to negotiate even between different spirits, negotiate between the spirits of nature and the human world and, and keeping all of that um, in order, you know, helping it be a win-win for all the spirits is really the way the shamans and tribal societies work. I mean, my Nepalese teacher, Bola, he talks about the... the uh, there are ancestral spirits on the land. There are, there are different kinds of nature deities that they honor in Nepal. They have uh, like a primordial shaman being called Banjakri, which is a little golden dwarf. And uh, I read about that in one of your books. That was pretty. Yeah, pretty you know. Cool. So they've got all these different kinds of spirits, and it would be the shaman's job to negotiate with everybody. You know, right. to try to to keep it all running smoothly. It, you know, going back to the paranormal research then, wouldn't it, I mean, several of us here are sensitive, uh, uh, and you were talking about acting as mediums during investigations. The majority of our team does. Uh, yeah. Somewhere. We all have different, we all have different uh, strengths. Um, yeah. and, and Lisa and I, you know, and can all be in the same room and get different things. So, from a shamanic standpoint, um, you know, how does how does the sensitive protect themselves, uh, you know, during an investigation? Is it, I mean, you know, if, if you don't have that specific training, um, how can one negotiate to a spirit, I guess, to to help keep themselves and their and their teammates safe? Well, you know, in, in our tradition, we merge with a power animal. And being merged with the helpful healing spirit that we have come to trust, it's like having kind of spiritual bubble wrap around you. The the information still gets in, but you don't get slimed by anybody, anybody or any spirits, uh, unbeneficial energy. So you can perceive it, but not get slimed. And that, to me, right. I mean, I basically emerged all the time because you know you don't have to pick up people's angry energy; they're anxious energy whether they be living or dead you know you don't have to you can perceive it you can notice it but it doesn't have to uh affect you and this is particularly important for people that are super empathetic the real sensitives that just feel everything around them i mean that just takes so much out of your hide and to have that little bit of extra protection around you lets you receive the information that you need without it having to bowl you over yeah, and I tell people that too. When, when I, for a long time, I, I mean, I knew I was uh, different, I guess, mm -hmm. but I didn't know what. And and for a long time, I thought I was crazy, flat out. I mean, absolutely thought I was nuts. And after yeah. you know, after really working in the paranormal, it brought me out to a point where I know you know what I am and what I can do, and and. The abilities that I have, which, which to me was just completely a weight lifted off of my chest because, you know, when you think you're crazy and you try to drink away all these crazy feelings, um, it, it, it's, you know, alcohol doesn't help the matter. Um, right. at the time, it actually intensifies, right, that at the time you think, oh, I feel better. Not really. But <laughs> at least I'm not feeling like I'm crazy right at this very second. <laughs> So, you know, I mean, and, and a lot of people, you know, you, you go into, we've seen people come into tours that didn't know they were sensitive and get affected by it. Um, I, and, yeah, well, beside me, I knew I was, I knew I was somewhat of a, like, maybe not a sensitive, but like different, because I've seen stuff my whole life. <laughs> but 
but you know, we have people that come into these events. We had somebody not too long ago that she just like started crying, shaking, carrying on, and had no idea, you know. And and it's you know, people need to know that this is not a game. You know, this is uh, exactly. legitimate research, and 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 coming into a a perceived uh, paranormal situation can very can actually potentially be detrimental to your psyche. Um, I've seen that happen to people. Right. Now, Lisa's been around a lot longer than I have, and she's seen some pretty bad stuff go down. You know, people bigger than me lift it off their butt and. Put on, put on their feet, put on the floor. But so you know, and, and protecting yourself is extremely important. It's something that we preach pretty heavily to our team, team members, and new team members. Um, but so that you know, that the shamanic work to me has been beneficial to to my own work as a paranormal researcher. Um, and the deeper that I get into the shamanism, the deeper, the better I am at what I do. Um, oh yeah, and. You know, you have the tool, too, to be able, before you even go on site, to journey ahead of time to find out what you're going into, what kind of support is needed in that place, what the spirits are needing in that place, so that you have that that preparation before you even enter in. So, you know, you can put the two of them together beautifully in that way. Oh, absolutely. And I, and I, I did, before I knew about journeying, I would tell Lisa, I'm not going. <laughs> I mean, I didn't even have to go. I just, I'm not going. You know, if I feel like it's it's detrimental to myself or anybody else, I'm, I, there's no, you're not going to get me in there. Um, I wish I'd known that about the Olivia building, but, you know. <laughs> well, if you had, you wouldn't be here. If I had, I wouldn't be here. I wouldn't have got drug in by my phone. And so. The Olivia is so bad. No, the Olivia is a good location. I wish we could find it. Yeah. Here's a question that you and I actually were discussing with him last night. Um, Evan, have you uh, encountered um, shamans or uh, energy workers who share their energy to spirit? I, I'm having a little bit harder time hearing you. Could John, could you repeat what she asked? Um, she, she asked if, if, if you've ever come across the shamans or or spirit or spirit workers that shroud themselves from from spirit. Like, hide from it. Oh, well, they try to, anyway. There are some people that try. It doesn't go very well, but they try. (laughs) You know, if you're being called to do this work, I think sooner or later you're going to be doing the work, you know, or you're going to be miserable. Like, like changing changing their energy so that they really cannot be seen. uh, That their appearance changes. Almost like a... Like shape-shifting. Yeah, like a veil. Like a veil more. Yeah, that's, that's absolutely possible. And working with the spirits that you know and trust can provide that kind of barrier so that you're, you know, you can sort of work in stealth mode. Can you give a, a little bit of an indication of how, how, how... How would somebody do that? How does that work? Yeah. Well, you know, it would probably be different for each individual. That's the kind of thing I would go to my primary teacher and ask, you know, how can I be completely protected in this circumstance? How can I be, you know, able to be doing the work without revealing myself? And so the, the it may be that this, the uh, teacher that I work with, the spirit teacher that I work with, provides some kind of running interference for me. They may set up, um, I mean, it could could be any possible way that they could do that because it would depend on the situation. You know, sometimes you only need protection and the spirits are so involved in their own world they don't even perceive you. Other times they're, you know, angry, pissed off, and you really need to be protected. (laughs) Or you need to be working kind of in stealth mode so they don't try to weasel out of what you need him to do, you know, so it depends on the circumstance. Yeah, I think this, you know, I think the stealth mode is probably more of what Lisa was getting at is like uh, basically almost scrambling their energy to where they don't exist in a sense. The spirit energy. Yeah. And, 
I know I was really surprised someone who does that because I can see when they do that and I'm told that the living is not supposed to be able to do that. Well, <laughs> yeah. Well, again, it would depend on the circumstance because it, it, sometimes I think that would be really beneficial, particularly if you've got either a, a whole bunch, if you're in a place like that's a, um, a disaster location or a battlefield mm. where the, they're just coming at you from all directions, mm -hmm. to be able to have that that space around you so that you're really safe while you're doing the work would make complete sense. Other times, you know, the, the spirits tend to be oblivious that you're even present, and you have to really interrupt their their loop to be able to engage with them and help them. So it really would vary, I think, from situation to situation. I agree with that. I, you know, we, we deal with a lot of our, – our main focus really is like Civil War – Battlefield homes, uh, things like that of that era, because this is a history night, and that's pretty much all she'll let us do. But I'm just kidding. No, that's, a, that's just a. Well, and it's good you do it as a group. It's good that you yeah, do it as a group. So no, this way you don't have to worry. You don't have to worry about bringing anybody home accidentally. You know, you don't right. want we to don't, wind up being possessed yeah. yourself. Well, and we, we we do work as a group, and we always uh, have. Uh, things on hand to be able to clean uh, ourselves before or after we leave and before or whatever. Good, um, good. And we've actually, you know, uh, had to at certain locations. Um, yeah, <laughs> looking at Susan. <laughs> and um, so, you know, that's that's good information, really, because, like I said, we do we deal with, uh, we go to Battlefield, one of the Battlefields over in Carthage uh, as often as we can. Um, and uh, if we have groups come in, we always like to take them out there because Lisa has some interesting stories from that place. But um, and you know, so, uh, one of our locations, the Kendrick House, is a, is a, a pre-Civil War, Civil War era home, uh, and the battle went right through there. So that's that's a pretty wild area, generally too. Um, did you have something to tell me? You want to say something? <laughs> So, yeah, I mean, being able to surround yourself, I think, or, you know, protect yourself is probably the, the most important thing working in this field uh, that people need to learn. I, 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 we, we, like I said, harp on it quite a bit. Um, whether you believe in, you know, and, and we try to say, you know, wh whatever your belief structure is, have a belief structure. You know, right. um, whatever your your faith system or whatever, I don't care, honestly, as long as you you know, understanding we can put it into practice. I think that's the important part. Well, you know, you think about the, the, the way lifeguards learn to save somebody when they're drowning and not wind up getting pulled under themselves is, you know, you learn to, to hold under that person that's struggling in such a way that they can't pull you under. And in some ways, when you're working with spirits that are so distraught, you have to make sure that you are going to be safe while you're doing the work for them. You know, it's right. just, it, it's sensible. <laughs> right. Well, and there's no point, especially doing shamanic work where you're doing healing work. You know, I know people that are, are vibrational healers and, and Reiki masters and, and so on and so forth. If, you, if you're going to do healing work, you have to be able to uh, protect yourself from that other person's energy and not soak it up. Staying grounded, you know, um, is probably, to me, one of the biggest keys. Uh, to keeping yourself out of trouble, especially when you're dealing with energy work, keeping keeping that that grounding to earth. And I know that you talk about that quite a bit in your book, correct? Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, it's like a tree. The deeper the roots, the taller the tree can grow. And it's right. the same idea. The deeper our roots, the more that we can expand and do the work. Yeah, that's that's actually an excellent way of putting it. <laughs> I didn't thought about it. I guess that way. But. Evelyn, what are your 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 takes? In, in the paranormal world, there, there's always a lot of discussion of inhuman entities, demonic entities, things like that. From a uh, shamanistic perspective, how, how would you explain those kind of very negative forces? The, the ones that I have dealt with that presented themselves as what would look like monstrous or demonic are usually spirits that, the spirits of the dead that have died in such a negative emotional state and so long ago, they've sort of become just that emotional energy. So if they were 
filled with rage, they become this monstrous kind of raging energy, uh, angry energy, whatever it might be. And, and it, when you're negotiating with them, you can start to bring forth that seed of their humanity again. But it takes this having to work through, and I, I would always do it with a spirit teacher, work through all of that that uh, that really hard energy to deal with. I mean, it's it's fierce, it's angry, it's destructive. In the in the same way, you know, if you have a toddler that's having a tantrum, they can really break shit up, you know, <laughs> and <in> some ways. <laughs> The spirits can be like that. If you think somebody has been in that tantrum energy for a couple of centuries, you know, any other sense of who they are is sort of faded away. And it it takes a lot of negotiating to try to speak to that core that's still present in there. And sometimes it's buried pretty deeply. But and I, I have to... I'm so grateful to the spirit that I work with with this is my great great grandmother, and she's brilliant at first of all being fearless, and then continuing to work with them and really being a loving presence that begins to kind of melt that uh, hostile exterior, and oftentimes it's somebody that has just been so either cruelly treated or they've had something really horrible happen as a part of their dying. You know, somebody who saw their family massacred, or they burned to death in a fire, and, you know, whatever it might be, that there is a tremendous amount of pain and anger present in that spirit. And once you can move through that, you know, like coaxing the core of who they are back, then you can... You can work with them to move on, but hum, human emotional energy can even become an entity. It doesn't necessarily have to be the spirit of the dead, but if there's been a big emotional discharge in an area, such as a battlefield, that energy becomes like an entity. You know, it becomes sense. this. It becomes this palpable. Uh, almost physical kind of sense that you can perceive when you go into that space. But again, working with the trusted spirits that you work with, you can dis that, that miasma, that, that kind of uh, spiritual sickness in the land, and bring back the vitality of that space. And do you think a lot of that can be done with, uh, you know, you talk about in your book about creating like sacred space in your backyard. Um, do you think that, that like a battlefield like that could be uh, changed just by changing the environment, like making it more of a happy space? And and bringing a great deal of love and compassion into that space. I mean, you think about those soldiers died, they were, they were quite often very young, they were idealistic, they were taught by one side or the other that they were doing the right thing, they died in excruciating ways, and perhaps dis disillusioned by the whole thing. I mean, there was a lot of emotional energy involved there, probably yeah. in every battlefield, you know. And so to think about the fact that they, that if they're stuck there, they're really still in that suffering, in all that they experienced as they were dying. And it, in the work that you do, the work that, that I do in, in uh, shamanic work is about, you know, somehow reaching through all that, you know, all that negative stuff to reach for these, these beings that really need our help. You know, they're stuck, they're lost. And, you know, it's kind of like you, you'd reach out if you saw a kid that was lost and crying someplace or, you know, you've, somebody's lost their dog you see a dog shivering someplace on a corner, you would reach out naturally and want to help that being. And it's really the same thing. They just happen to be dead. <laughs> you know, it's that, that feeling of this, this being is, it may be terrified or angry in the same way that a, a dog that's run away might be scared and want to snap at you. 
but really, they're, they're terrified. That, that is an excellent way to put it. That is, that is really, and I, I don't mean to cut you off there, but that is really a good way to put it. And I, and I hadn't thought of it that way. You know, I, I have, my son and I have 300,000 cats that we feed on a regular basis. <laughs> Um, I had a new one this year. Yeah, I had a new one. We had a new one all the time. <laughs> so but just, you know, they're, they're, we can't just let them not eat. You know what I mean? And, 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 and I can see it's a compassion thing. It's a mm-hmm. compassion for, for the spirit, even though we can't, you know, we tend to forget about things that we can't see. I mean, we can see a baby kitten. I mean, we can see right. the kitten. We know, we know that that kitten needs love and attention and, and, um, and food and so forth. And, but we can't see spirit, and, and 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 unless it makes some sort of, you know, well, most people can't see spirit. Thank you, Lisa. But <laughs> most people. But they can perceive them. Even the ones right. that can't see them can still feel them. That's true, but and, but you know, and but they may not may not put that into pers- uh, a what it, perspective of what it actually is. You know, like I used to sit on my couch and go crazy. Well. That wasn't necessarily me, right? You know, that was. Right. I mean, it, was. it was, but I mean, I am crazy. But you know, there was there was other things involved there that was causing me to feel that way. You know, mm-hmm. um, and so you know, reaching out to those spirits to try to bring them back, I think is is is, is amazing work. I mean, I it, it's something that uh, uh, I would like to do someday. But you know, and I'm going to tell people this: don't don't do this type of work without the right training. Right? Oh, I completely really, agree. You, you can really harm yourself, people around you, um, you know, the person that was asking for the help. I mean, this is, these are things that, uh, you know, you really should have proper training and, and many years of, uh, of work in this, in uh, shamanism or so forth. But, uh, we're coming. We're coming short on time, and I want to talk for like 400 more hours. But we should have that one back. We, 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 we really should have that one back. And, and, and are you writing any more books, or are they in the in the works? Oh, I'm always got something in the works. So sure, you bet. Uh, you and I'd love to come back and and have another conversation. This has really been great. Uh, can you tell people how they can get a hold of you? Um, you know, if they're wanting to, to get some work, uh, some sort of healing work done, or, sure. or the workshops, or, or the books, or so forth. Sure, they can actually go to my author page, which is my name, Evelyn Rysdyke, E V E L Y N, and Rysdyke is R Y like in yellow, S like in Sam, D like in David, Y like in yellow, K dot com, and you can find links for all that good stuff right there. Yeah, and everybody, I, honestly, I, I I love Evelyn's books. Um, I haven't found one yet that's just been uh, that's been bad. I mean, the, the information is fantastic, um, easy to read. I'm I'm kind of a slow country boy. If I can if I can figure it out, uh, everybody can. So, hey, Jeff Rowe. Jeff Rowe. <laughs> Evelyn, thank you very much for coming on. I really appreciate it, and uh, looking hey. more, looking forward to working with you more. And I did very much. Keep doing the good work where you guys are there. <laughs> yeah, you do. The, you're doing the good work. We're, we're just investigating it. <laughs> Thank you. Take care. Yeah, bye bye. Bye. And thank you for everyone for showing up for the show tonight. That was awesome. I love that. I mean, she's she's just fantastic to talk to. Great lady. Um, who we got next week? Anybody? Yeah. Oh, we're gonna do a circle, aren't we? Yeah. We're gonna do a circle next week. Circle chat. We'll probably get some of this information and bounce it around. And, uh, go for that. We were talking about the other day that we said that we did the topic for. I remember. Oh, actually, off of last week's show, it was, uh, what, uh, the yeah, that was Mark. Okay. <laughs> All right, let's, let's get out of here. All right, guys. Thank you. For, we'll be back next week with a, with a group chat. And uh, hope you all have a great weekend. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye.